Hello everyone. I would like to welcome you to this webinar on a preview of the changes of the 2017 National Electrical Code. Want to um, give you an idea here exactly who is speaking at the moment. And I just want to ask John, uh, have you made me the presenter, John? Because it looks like you're still the presenter and I want to be able to change my slides. So you've got yes, to... You are the presenter. Okay. All right. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to give you a little bit of idea uh, who TPC Training System is. We do offer uh, some online courses. We also have a consulting service. We have uh, iSchematic where we can put uh, your diagram of your machine on a, on a little notepad type thing. And then uh, TPC Tranco where we offer uh, live seminars. So we like to think of ourselves as the total uh, solution to industrial skills uh, training. I am uh, Bob Kluke, so been in the electrical trade since 1971, grew up with the National Electrical Code in my hand, so have a bachelor's degree in education, associate's degree in electrical power, I am a member of the International Association of Electrical Inspectors, I am a non-restricted electrical contractor in the state of Georgia, and um, like I say, I've been in the trade since about 1971. So I want to get right into our uh, changes a little bit. There were 4,012 public inputs. We used to call those proposals, but uh, the NFPA changed their format on how to submit uh, proposals. They now call those public inputs. And uh, then once uh, they received those uh, public inputs, the code making panels came up with about uh, a little over 1,200 first revisions. And then when they went to their, their second revision and then finally the publication of the code, uh, a little over about a thousand uh, changes. So five new articles are in the new 2017 National Electrical Code. I'd like to take a look at those uh, first. The first one is in uh, Chapter 4. It deals with uh, Article uh, 425, brand new article, uh, fixed resistance and electrode industrial process heating equipment. So th this is going to apply to the installation of boilers and electrode boilers, duct heaters, strip heaters, immersion heaters, process air heaters, or any type of approved fixed uh, electrical equipment used for industrial uh, process heating. It's not going to cover um, room air conditioners or things like that. I would like to mention that we, you can type in your chat box anytime uh, questions and at the end of, of this uh, webinar I will address those questions. So if you have questions you just type those into your chat box as we are speaking and then at the end of the presentation we'll address uh, all your questions for you. There were a, uh, the other articles that are, are new are sort of deal with distribution. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll say the production, storage, and distribution of electrical power. So this first one in Chapter 6, large-scale photovoltaic electric supply stations. Of course, we've always had Article 690, which was our photovoltaic article, but this article is going to deal with systems that are 5 megawatts and larger. And so, really, the code-making panels were reacting to what's already uh, out there. There were some very large uh, photovoltaic uh, projects, and our uh, inspectors needed uh, some type of guidance on how to make sure that these were installed correctly. So, they came up with uh, Article 691, and it now gives the inspectors a chance to uh, make sure that these are installed in accordance with uh, manufacturer's instructions and our new Article uh, 691. So here we have a way of producing the electricity very, on a large scale. And we're not talking about here uh, utilities. Now, the, the, this is uh, private businesses that would have these large-scale uh, photovoltaic systems. So we know that the National Electrical Code really doesn't cover utilities, but uh, private business is now uh, getting into the uh, business of producing electricity, especially with these uh, large-scale photovoltaic systems. So you can see here a uh, very large uh, solar farm and many of these uh, all over the world and a, and a lot here in the uh, U.S. 
then once we once we generate this electricity, we've got to have a way to store it. We might not be using it, uh, uh, you know, completely uh, the minute that it's uh, generated. So Article 706, energy storage systems, and um, these are going to apply to anything over 50 volts AC or 50 volts DC. They can be standalone. They can be interactive, so they could be grid tied right back to the uh, grid, and um, they might have. Uh, a lot of things uh, going on. They might be uh, batteries, uh, capacitors, flywheels, compressed air, but uh, basically it's something that's going to give us an AC or DC output for utilization equipment. Might have some inverters or converters uh, connected to it, but it is going to be able to store uh, the energy that we have produced. So a typical system uh, would look like this. You can see we have our energy storage and then uh, we might be uh, in interactive with the grid, we might have a, a grid tie there, or we might be just using it uh, for our own uh, building that we have right on our premises. Standalone systems, this would be a, a smaller system, and I sometimes compare this to, I might see a, um, a solar panel on the side of the road, and it, and it might be uh, operating maybe a, a flasher or whatever that, that we might need on the side of the road. So this is another way that we're producing the electricity uh, a, a lot of times uh, with photovoltaics. And this is a little bit smaller system, but uh, the, the National Electrical Code and the code making panels did want to make sure that they covered these systems also. And here we can see that we now want to distribute the electricity. So if we have that large-scale system and then, and then we have our energy storage uh, method, we have to distribute it. So they put these DC microgrids in also. Power distribution system, uh, one or more interconnected DC power sources. It could be converters. Uh, it could, could be inverting it back to uh, AC. And uh, so many times it's not our, our primary source of power, but um, it, it sometimes uh, is. So here you could see that we could be supplying uh, things like LED lighting, um, you know, our IT equipment, Basically, whatever the capability of that uh, DC microgrid is, we could, we could have utilization equipment uh, being supplied uh, by this DC microgrid. And here's an example. We have, of course, a, a photovoltaic system, and then we're coming in to, uh, to whatever, whatever we're going to use uh, that electricity for. So there's, whoops, excuse me, there has been a change a little bit in Article 90 on how we are going to identify the changes that the code making panels have put uh, into the code. So if, if you're an experienced code user, you would know that uh, historically we had um, written material highlighted with gray. We would have a vertical line down the side of uh, new articles or or even new tables. Well, the vertical line has gone away, and we're going to now see an italic N, and it's going to be to the left of the new material. And you, you're going to, you, you will see that uh, as I go through this presentation. I have one slide that shows that to you. But pretty handy uh, as you're looking through the close to 900 pages of the National Electrical Code, if you see this N, uh, to the top left of a section or, or an article, you knew that now know that that is brand new. And just like before, we still have the bullet, so if there was some information that was uh, deleted or relocated to a different section of the code, you will see that little dot in the left-hand margin. But uh, the italic N is something very new, so we got rid of the vertical line and we now have uh, an italic N in there for us. In 90.2a, they did add the word removal. So now the code covers installation and removal of electrical conductors. In previous editions of the National Electrical Code, we would see that uh, we did have to remove any temporary wiring. We had uh, some communication cables that were uh, definitely under under some of these uh, data center floors had to be removed unless they were uh, marked and identified for when they were, were going to be used. But now, if we're just going to go in and do demolition, the National Electrical Code is going to cover the removal of those conductors. 
And so that's a very far-reaching effect that they put in with that one uh, little word. Also, our code arrangement uh, changed up just a little bit in 2014 and in previous code sections, chapters 5, 6, and 7, uh, they basically said that they could modify our general chapters, which are 1 through 4. So what we have to think about here a little bit is chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, they apply basically to everything that we do. But chapters 5, 6, and 7 has, have always been modification chapters. And they always were sort of related to they're going to modify chapters 1 through 4. Now the code making panels have, have clarified that chapters 5, 6, and 7 can also modify each other. So they're going to say may modify 1 through 7. So if we see something in chapter 2, let's say that we go to 210.8, which might be GFIs, and we see that uh, we could have... Um, G GFIs need to be installed in basements. Well, in Chapter 7, we might see uh, uh, an, a modification there that it would say that if, if we had in that basement a fire alarm system, then that will not be on a GFI. So it, there's some little modification there. Chapter 8, of course, is a standalone chapter, and that's our communication system. The only way that Chapters 1 through 4 would apply to Chapter 8 is if they were referenced in Chapter 8. And then Chapter 9 is our tables. And then the annexes, which are informative annexes, but still uh, a lot of information in the annexes. So the biggest change here is Chapters 5, 6, and 7 can modify each other, not just Chapters uh, 1 through 4. A new definition that we, uh, well, a revised definition that we see in Article 100 is, is I, I really in, like this one because I conduct a lot of seminars on the National Electrical Code uh, throughout the year, and this was always a big topic of discussion. So readily accessible, capable of being reached quickly for operation, renewal or inspections, and that pretty much is the same that it's always been. And uh, then it says, without requiring those to whom ready access is requisite to take actions such as to use tools. But what they put in here was other than keys. That was a huge topic of discussion. People would ask me, let's say in an, in an apartment building or an office building or some type of commercial building, they would say, can we lock those panels and are they still readily accessible? And my answer to them always was yes, because they were readily accessible to um, the qualified person that did have that key. But I never really had any type of documentation to back me up on my answer. But now uh, the code making panel has put in other than keys. So as long as, as long as I can open or close that door with a key, it is still readily accessible. Uh, the technical committee did a great job on that change. In 110.3c, uh, this is something that um, is brand new. Prior to uh, this uh, edition of, of the National Electrical Code, we only had 110.3a and b. And basically, it was the examination of equipment uh, in a. And in 110.3b, it was the fact that we had to follow the instructions that came with that listed equipment. Now they added C. And what they're telling us here is that uh, when a product is um, tested, evaluated, and listed, it has to be performed by a recognized uh, qualified electrical testing lab. So there were some uh, entities out there that were trying to list products that might not be uh, one of these uh, qualified electrical testing labs, and in the informational note, it tells us that OSHA has a list of the labs that they want to see uh, the mark of. So some of the labs that we're very uh, familiar with, of course, would be UL, Underwriters Laboratory, CSA, Canadian Standards Association, uh, TUV, the European uh, Testing Agency. So OSHA has a list of all those labs, and as long as, as the mark that we see is, is one of those uh, qualified electrical testing laboratories, then we're all set. But of course, we do have to follow the instructions that come with that equipment, so we better, that's in 110.3b. Uh, brand new in 110.14d, and in 110.14, of course, they're talking about electrical connections and how they impact our installation. 
but now it's telling us that um, where a tightening torque is indicated as a numeric value on equipment or in the installation instructions provided by the manufacturer, we do have to use a torque tool. It shall be used to achieve the indicated torque value. So it really doesn't matter what I pick up these days. I could pick up a molded case circuit breaker and if I looked at the side of that circuit breaker, I'm going to see on there that I'm supposed to torque that screw to 25 inch pounds. So we really never used torque tools to, to do that. Well, we always should have been because it was in the manufacturer's instructions. So now the, the technical committee made it very clear that we are going to have to torque our connections to the value that the manufacturer has specified and they put that in in 110.14d. And you can see what might happen if, in fact, we are not talking uh, our, our connections the proper manner. So very important that, that we are talking and that we uh, have the proper tool to do that. 110.16, of course, is deals with labeling. So in prior editions of the code, there were very generic statement, and this is what we saw. We saw electrical equipment, and uh, they gave us some examples of, of what uh, we would have to put a label on, and it said it shall be field or factory mark um, to warn us of electric arc flash hazards. A very generic statement, and this could be something as simple as warning, arc flash hazard, and that could be put on in the field, or it could also be have been put on uh, at the manufacturer in the in the factory. Didn't really tell us exactly how to protect ourselves uh, from uh, the arc flash hazard. We would have had to have gone to NFPA 70E to get some detail on uh, what to put on that label, which would be the uh, arc flash boundary, the voltage, and either the incident energy uh, or the PPE category. So a lot of, lot of uh, public inputs and proposals put into this section. I have submitted many myself. And so what, what occurred here now is they've got a new section, a new addition, and it's 110.16b. And this is going to apply to other than dwelling units and only to the service. But it does say that we're going to have to have a permanent label, field or factory applied, if that service equipment is rated 1,200 amps or more. And we do have to meet the requirements of 110.21b, which basically says the equipment has, the uh, label has to be permanently affixed to the equipment. Um, you know, the, there'll be uh, uh, special fonts there that we use in accordance with ANSI Z535 standard. But what the information we have to have on this new label that uh, for a service rated 1,200 amps or more is we have to have the voltage, of whatever voltage we have uh, for the service, we've got to have the available fault current. And so we've got to be able to calculate fault current and make sure we get that on that label, the clearing time of the overcurrent device, and the date the label was applied. Now you can see that there's an exception here, that if we have already installed on this equipment uh, a label that is in accordance with, let's say, NFPA 70E, where we would have on there, um, the incident energy listed, the voltage would already be listed, or the arc flash boundary would be listed, then this label is, is not required. But of course, uh, a big difference between NFPA 70, which is our installation document, and then 70E, which was the electrical standard for workplace safety, uh, there's, there's quite a difference there in labeling. So many times that label required by 70E is not put on at the time of installation. It's put on uh, sometime after the installation has taken place. So now they are going to require a very specific label for us and uh, we are going to have to be able to calculate fault current. Uh, for the people on this uh, webinar, I can let you know that right on my phone I have a I have a, fault, a free app, it's a fault current calculator, and I can get very close to that available fault current uh, very quickly. So we're going to have to make sure we do have a handle on fault current and clearing time. It's, it's very important uh, for the safety of our electrical workers and uh, make sure we have a, a method that we can calculate uh, that 
And if you do have the software that uh, might be associated with an incident energy analysis, then very easily you could use that software. Uh, otherwise, there, there's apps and other ways of getting that information uh, on that label, but very important for worker safety. So here's what it might look at like. So the top part is very a generic label. 110.16 always required that. Now in the 110.16b, you can see that these are the four items listed. The fault current that is going to be uh, available at that uh, switch gear, the clearing time, the voltage, and the date that we put the label on. So a little bit of change there in, as far as labeling goes with services that are uh, 1,200 amps and over. Uh, continuing in Article 110, uh, general installation requirements, many times we might send equipment out to be reconditioned, refurbished. Okay, so that's great and it comes back. Well, the inspector really had no uh, guidance on really how that equipment was reconditioned and what happened. So now there, you've got to mark that with the name, trademark, uh, something f by which the organization that did the reconditioning uh, you know, we get to know their name and the date of the reconditioning. So it also has to have on there that the equipment was reconditioned. And now it can be acceptable only if approved uh, by that authority having jurisdiction. So approval is not based on the original listing of that equipment because it's been modified. So the uh, inspector has to know how it was modified, uh, you know, what changes were, were made so that he can approve the new uh, reconditioned equipment. So brand new uh, section in, in Article 110. So this all has to be marked with who reconditioned it, uh, the date that it was um, reconditioned, so the inspector has a little bit of information to go on. Also in 110.24, we can see that uh, back to fault current again, and, and this section has been in the code. They only really um, inserted one little tiny word here, but if we do have service equipment that is um, in other than dwelling units, it, it has always had to been marked uh, with the available fault current. That's been true of the last uh, three or four code cycles and uh, had to include the date that the uh, calculation was performed and we had to make sure that uh, uh, the label could withstand the environment we're going to put it in. But it says that the calculation shall be documented, made available to those who design, install, inspect, maintain, or operate the system. So that's the new one, or operate the system. So basically, we just want to get that available fault current on that equipment so whoever interacts with this uh, equipment will know that um, you know, there, there's a significant amount of fault current if, in fact, we do have a short circuit or ground fault uh, occur uh, inside that equipment. Continuing in Article 110, we can see there was a lot of changes there. Working space. So a lot of, in 110.26 there is a lot of information about uh, working space, but they did add, add this um, in 110.26A4, limited access. So really we're, we're talking about uh, a suspended ceiling. And when we get up above that suspended ceiling, there's just not a lot of lot of room to work. So it could also be in a crawl space, any, any place really where you have limited access. But um, if the opening is um, not smaller than 22 by 22 and uh, in a crawl space um, uh, the opening not smaller than 22 by 30, then uh, the width of our working space uh, in these uh, limited access areas has to be 30 inches. Um, or the width of the equipment, whichever is greater. The doors have to be able to be open at a minimum of 90 degrees, and the space is going to have to comply with Table 110.26A1, which um, would probably tell us that we need at least three feet for condition number one. And so we can take a look at a piece of equipment that might be above some of these suspended ceilings. And basically, in, in previous uh, code cycles, we just didn't have any 
uh, room to work on, on something like this uh, HVAC equipment or whatever might be up there. So now they're going to give us a chance. They're going to give us a chance to be able to at least open the door and, and be able to put some test equipment in there or do whatever we have to do to service that equipment. Continuing in Article 110, you can see there was a lot of changes uh, in this article, but if it is required, let's say, to commission some equipment and we have to document our, our testing. So um, where, wherever it is required in the co code, we've got to know the uh, system design, we've got to know the settings for our protective devices. Um, all this has to be prepared in advance, made available on request to the inspector, and it has to be tested when first installed. Uh, that test report also has to be available to the uh, AHJ prior to the point where he's going to allow us to energize that equipment and uh, made available to really anybody who's uh, authorized to install, operate, test, and maintain the system. So if we have some large equipment and we have to commission that equipment, now we're going to be able to see the results of any tests that were done prior to uh, energizing that equipment. Finally, we made it up into Article 210, which is branch circuits. And we've always had a requirement in Article 200 and also in uh, 210 that if we did have different systems, they wanted us to identify those different systems in our facility. So if we had uh, 208120 plus 48277, we might see something like this for 48277. We might see uh, black, red, blue with a white neutral for 208120. Now it's telling us that we have an existing installation. Okay, already have a system in there. Maybe we have uh, 208120 in there, and then all of a sudden we add another system. Okay, so now labeling is required at each voltage system distribution equipment to identify that uh, there is a new system and how we are uh, giving that information to our qualified electrical workers. So we're going to have to come up with some type of system, either a plaque or whatever, that um, you know the new system has to be identified. The, if it's the existing system, that's not required to be identified, only the new system that we put in. Of course, if we're building a brand new facility and we have different systems in there, we have to identify all of those systems. But this is an existing installation where we already have uh, one system available and we're adding uh, another system. 210.8 GFCIs. And we can see that uh, here they gave us a new uh, informational note for the purposes of this section. If we're going to determine the distance from the receptacle uh, to with the GFCI where it is, it's going to be the distance measured as the shortest path of the cord. So whatever that cord would take um, to the receptacle, um, and we're not going to f pierce a floor or wall ceiling or any kind of fixed barrier. So basically they're giving us and the inspector a way to actually measure if that GFCI is within, let's say, six feet of a, of a sink well, now they're telling us it's the shortest path of that cord. Dwelling unit garages, a little bit change here. That uh, the, the garage always had to be supplied by at least one 120-volt, uh, 20-ampere branch circuit. And it had always told us that this uh, circuit could have no other outlets. Now it's giving us an exception that if we have some uh, outdoor receptacles and they are readily accessible, that this circuit can supply those outdoor uh, receptacles. So if you have some uh, receptacles on the side of your garage, you could come uh, off that circuit that's right inside your garage and no issues whatsoever. Meeting room receptacles. So the technical committee uh, realized the fact that many meeting rooms that were built uh, 15, 20 years ago just do not have enough receptacles for 2016 where everybody walks in with a laptop. So they have told us, told us now, brand new section in 210.71, that the receptacles in a meeting room are, are going to have to comply a little bit with uh, 
210.52. And um, it's just that they, these rooms were not designed uh, 15, 20 years ago for all the electronic equipment that we're bringing in now. And uh, so they're going to have to make sure that these receptacles are complying with uh, 210.52A1 through 4. So when we go in there, we're going to see that if there's a certain area, um, and they tell us uh, at least 12 feet wide and at least 215 square foot, not more than over 1,000 square foot. It's got to have at least one receptacle located in the floor. Can't be uh, less than six feet uh, from any fixed wall. And uh, if there are movable room petitions, then we also have some measurement requirements there. And basically, they're at, at least giving us a chance that if we are going to have some type of meeting in these rooms now, that we will have an opportunity to plug in all of, all of our electronic equipment. Supports over buildings. So here we can see this picture, and, and that's great. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you can also see my cursor. If we had a support right here for this guy wire, and if that support happened to be metal, it now has to be bonded by means of a bonding jumper or a listed connector to the grounded overhead service conductor. So I've got to get to my grounded conductor and I'm going to have to get to that support that might be from the rooftop up to this guy wire. So we have to make sure that is bonded now. If there are any metal supports uh, on our roof to try to keep, um, even, even, if it, even if it was a metal support here that was trying to keep the, the height uh, of our overhead service conductors coming in, that would have to be bonded uh, also. So. Very important on that change. So here's a new table in Article 240, uh, which is our overcurrent protection article. And uh, here you can see the N. So in previous code cycles, this was just listed out uh, in uh, a paragraph of our standard uh, circuit breaker and fuse sizes. Now they gave us a table, and it's a brand new table. And you can see that there's no, going to be no vertical line down the side of these new tables anymore. It's just going to have that little italicized N. And so if, if you do have a current copy of the 2017 uh, National Electrical Code, either PDF or hard copy, those ends are going to tell you all the new uh, changes that have occurred in the 2017 version. Continuing in our overcurrent uh, protection article, 240.67 is uh, a method that we can now use to help uh, reduce the amount of incident energy that could uh, be uh, present when a worker goes up to a piece of equipment. So here they're talking about fuses rated 1,200 amps or higher. And uh, if, they, if we do install the, this uh, level of fuse protection, then 240.67 A and B are going to apply. This will become effective on January 1, 2020 to give the manufacturers a chance to um, get these fuses out on the market. Uh, one, we got to have documentation available to anybody that designs, installs, operates, or inspects the location, uh, or inspects the installation as to the location of the fuses. So we got to know where these fuses are. Next, if the uh, fuse has a clearing time of 0.07 seconds or less um, at the available arcing current, then we've got to. Uh, also have some additional protection, either differential relaying, um, we could have a maintenance mode on our, on our overcurrent device, we could have um, some type of energy reducing uh, arc flash mitigation system, somehow to get that incident energy low so that uh, our workers would not be uh, subject to some type of uh, arc flash. So remember now we're talking about arcing current, we're not talking about the bolted fault current. So this arcing current is usually about 65% less than the bolted fault. So if we have a bolted fault current of uh, 10,000, probably we'd be looking at about 6,500 amps uh, of arcing fault current. So you got to really know how to uh, read uh, one of those incident energy analysis uh, uh, programs that, that you know, the, the, uh, they, they will give us. And you got to know what the uh, arcing current is. 
staying on that same topic, up in 240.87, they did uh, add a couple ways that we can uh, reduce this uh, incident energy. We've always had uh, zone selective interlocking, differential relaying, the maintenance mode. Uh, they've added a few now, so we can see that uh, uh, 5, 6, and 7, an available arcing current greater than the instantaneous trip. Uh, basically, they're telling us we can uh, adjust this a little bit and an instantaneous override and then uh, or some type of an approved equivalent means. So if you, if you look at the little note at the bottom in the first revision, they decided that someone could avoid using uh, one of these uh, reduction methods by turning down uh, the instantaneous trip. So th they would do that. They'd set the uh, trip level of their of their switch gear, let's say, and their ground floor protection of equipment very low. And then after the inspection, they would turn it back up to make sure that they had uh, achieved some coordination in the building. So they wanted to make sure that one of these seven methods up here uh, was being employed so that we couldn't sort of bypass uh, the protection that our, our worker would need at the equipment. Circuits not to be grounded. They, they have added one here. They have added number six. So now we're up in Article 250, grounding and bonding. They, and uh, Class two load side circuits. So these are very uh, low energy circuits. And it says for the suspended ceiling low voltage power grid distribution system. So to give you an idea on that, I'll show you a picture. And so the ceiling grid itself now can be a conductor. And these do not have to be uh, grounded. They, in Article 250, it just told us that they do not have to be grounded. And the reason being is because uh, we are below 50 volts. These are usually 24 volt uh, either AC or DC systems, uh, very low incident energy, and uh, really no uh, hazard present here. We're not going to receive a shock. We're not going to receive uh, any type of arc flash or arc blast. So that circuit does not have to be uh, grounded. In 250.30a, they're telling us that um, uh, on the grounding electrode, the, the grounding electrode system shall be used uh, for a separately derived system. So if that separately derived system is outdoors, so to begin with, let's um, give an example. Let's say we have a generator and our transfer switch is a full pole transfer switch so that we are transferring uh, phase A, B, C plus our neutral conductor and there is no direct electrical connection between uh, one source and another source so in this case between the generator and the utility then uh, if that generator is outdoors we are going to you know we can drive a ground rod at the generator that's no problem but that grounding electrode conductor does have to be connected to our grounding electrode system that is inside of our facility. So the building steel, the water water pipe that's coming in, uh, the uh, rebar in the concrete, uh, whatever we have used inside of our facility for a grounding electrode system, that has to be brought out to that separately derived system. So. We can drive a ground rod all day long out there, but that grounding electrode conductor will come into the building and connect to um, where our building steel is connected, uh, basically uh, right there in the service. Not permitted for use as grounding electrodes, and they have added one. Uh, the first two have been there for a long time, but they added um, that uh, in Article 680, the if the shell of our swimming pool is metal, that cannot be used as a grounding electrode. So they have told us that that will not be used. Next, we're still in Article 250. And if for some reason we increase our ungrounded conductors, so we increase them, let's say, for a voltage drop, then uh, we also have to increase in the same proportion the size uh, of our um, equipment grounding conductor. So we understand that uh, our equipment grounding conductor now could handle more fault current because we have larger size conductors going to our equipment and so we are going to definitely have to increase that uh, equipment grounding conductor to handle that additional fault current that might be present.
In uh, 300.5, of course, this is we have a table there that tells us the the minimum depth that we're going to have to dig trenches if we are going to install uh, some type of wiring underground. It does tell us this that uh, if we are installing uh, some low voltage lighting systems, so usually uh, LED. Uh, 12 volt lighting would be installed here. We'd have a, a small power supply to power that uh, 12 volt LED lighting. The, in, in table 300.5, it tells us right now that we would have to bury the conductors going to the, these uh, fixtures at six inch minimum depth. But if in the ins installation instructions, if they give us a lower depth, then we can go ahead and use the uh, lower depth that the manufacturer has provided for us uh, in, in the UL uh, listing of that uh, uh, fixture. So that's good news. Don't have to dig quite as deep uh, as we currently had to. Some uh, Also in Article 300, above ground wiring methods, uh, they gave us an exception for what we could have uh, exposed. And this is in airfield lighting where you would have these uh, regulators. Uh, usually these are installed in vaults. Um, they're restricted access areas. And so they are going to permit uh, these conductors to be exposed uh, inside uh, of these vaults that come down uh, to the regulators for that series lighting uh, on the runway. Uh, this table has been in the, about the last three code cycles that it was in the code. And if we did install uh, some type of wiring method on roofs, depending on how close we were to the roof, we had to make an adjustment uh, in ampacity for what we believed was the uh, in increase in temperature because we were so close to that, to that roof and the sun would be heating that roof all the time. Well, uh, the uh, Southern Nevada, Nevada chapter of the International Association of Electrical Inspectors um, sponsored an, an investigation and they found out that really there was no additional heating of conductors uh, up on that roof. And so they submitted their data to the uh, technical committee and this table has now been deleted uh, from 310.50. So it is no longer there. So we do not have to make an adjustment for conductors that are installed on roofs anymore. In uh, Article 400, they gave us a little bit idea here that we can purchase some flexible cords that might not be listed. And so these flexible cords might come from anywhere. We're not sure where, but the use of these uh, cords, other than those that are specified in Table 400, that Dot four, they can still be used as long as the authority having jurisdiction has given us permission to use them. So if we do find some cords out there that might not be in Table 400.4, we just talk to uh, the inspector or whoever the authority is. If they say that cord is fine, we can still uh, use that cord, no problem whatsoever. In uh, 406, which is our article on receptacles, there are some receptacles that are controlled by a building automation system or an energy management system. And so when that is the case, the word controlled now has to be right on the receptacle itself. And we also have to have a symbol on there that indicates that it's controlled uh, by this uh, energy management system because this receptacle could be shut off uh, at times during the day. And we should understand that that could occur. So you're going to see um, the words controlled right on that receptacle plus a symbol. And that is now a requirement uh, in 406.3e. These are becoming very popular now, a receptacle with a USB charger um, uh, built right into the receptacle. So what what the uh, technical committee has told us is that these do have to be listed by some type of uh, agency that is in the uh, method of testing these and making sure they're okay. Because what we saw prior to the 2017 edition is that there were a lot of, um, of these USB charges that were 
being used that might not have been very safe uh, with the receptacle. So they decided that uh, they better put this in. This does have to have now a listing from a recognized uh, uh, testing laboratory, and now we should be 100% safe um, with any receptacle that has a USB charger built right into it. 406.12, tamper-resistant receptacles. They have uh, expanded where tamper-resistant res receptacles have to be installed. Of course, they were always uh, for a long, you know, for three or four code cycles, they were in dwelling units, plus uh, in hotels and motels, childcare facilities. But now they're going preschools, elementary education facilities, business offices, corridors, waiting rooms, in uh, clinics, medical, dental offices. Uh, any type of places where there might be a, a lot of people uh, uh, congregated, like uh, waiting transportation rooms, gymnasiums, skating rinks, and in dormitories, we've had them for a while also, but they are expanding uh, where tamper-resistant receptacles uh, do have to be installed. In 410.6, uh, which is our requirement on uh, luminaires or lighting fixtures, they there has been a tremendous uh, push to retrofit any type of luminaire we have to LED technology. So I can take a 2x4 drop-in fixture that might have um, TH or T5 installed and I can retrofit that to um, LED technology very quickly. But they are telling us now that that retrofit kit, it does have to be listed. It has to be listed by the manufacturer and listed for the uh, luminaire that we're going to install it. So pretty much you, if you have a certain brand of, of luminaires, you want to purchase their retrofit kit that goes uh, with that certain brand. That way the retrofit kit and the luminaire will match up and it will have been uh, tested by some type of, of testing laboratory for us. Okay, so just want to give you an idea that uh, TPC does offer about uh, 1,500 uh, instructor-led seminars each year. If you did want to uh, take a look at our schedule, you could go to tpctranco.com slash NEC2017. Um, we also offer on-sites. I just uh, was at a facility the other day, and uh, we're going to be uh, doing a three-day training at their facility uh, on NFPA 70 and NFPA 79, which is industrial machinery. So all you have to do if you ever want to think that you might want uh, uh, one of our trainers come to your facility, just sales at tpctranco.com, and we would definitely be there to help you. And I may want to make sure that you do have my email address, which is uh, rkluke at tpctranco.com, because uh, I'll be here to answer any questions uh, that you might have even after this uh, seminar is over. But we are going to uh, open it up now to uh, questions. So we're going to see if we have any questions that have been uh, in the chat box. and. Um, Bob, we actually had a couple that were submitted to us through the uh, the question section there. Uh, but the first one I wanted to address was whether or not this presentation will be available to all of our attendees after this presentation. And the short answer is uh, yes. We're going to do that a couple of ways. First, this entire recorded webinar will be available on the TPC Tranco YouTube site uh, probably by the end of tomorrow. So if somebody missed the webinar, or you want to revisit it sometime down the road, it will uh, be there live for you to check out on YouTube anytime you want. Um, also, on the confirmation email that you received for this webinar, um, my email address, jbusselmeyer at tpctraining.com is listed there on the bottom. If you need a PDF version of this um, webinar and this presentation, please just shoot me an email to that email address and I will get a PDF version of the presentation over to you. Uh, but Bob, the first question that we had was simply, when does the code become effective? Oh, that's a great question. So many states uh, are going to adopt uh, the 2017 National Electrical Code on January 1st of 2017. So I'm going to I'm going to say maybe about 50% of our states would adopt it at that time. Uh, other other states are going to adopt that about a year later. Um, 
I, I currently live in Georgia. We, we will adopt it on January 1st, 2018. And there are some other states that are definitely uh, going to wait a while to make sure that all the bugs are worked out. I know that Virginia and California sometimes wait uh, two or three years before they might adopt this code. But you have to check at the state level uh, for adoption. So it's completely up to each individual state, but many states will adopt this on January 1st of 2017. All right, thanks, Bob. Another question we had was 110.16b label has different parameters than what is required for an ARC flash label. How can the latter be a substitute for the former? Okay, that's a great question, and it's not a, not a substitute. So here's what we have to remember is that the National Electrical Code is an installation document. So to be able to have my service be inspected and passed, I have got to comply with 110.16b, which means that I need the available fault current, the voltage, the date that I put it on there. Uh, all that has to be on there for that service to pass inspection. So that's fine. And boom, my service just passed. That label now has no bearing after the certificate of occupancy has been issued, has no bearing at all on the standard NFPA 70E, which is workplace safety, because now I'm going to interact with that equipment. And so basically, it is two different uh, entities. And I when before we had 110.16b, I always told people this, that, you know, according to the National Electrical Code, I could go up and put an orange sticker on my equipment, and that would satisfy the National Electrical Code, because orange, uh, according to ANSI Z535, indicated warning. So I'm warning the people that there's a hazard there. And I could install my equipment, get it passed, and, and satisfy the electrical inspector. But the minute that that installation is over, let's say that uh, I received my payment, certificate of occupancy has been issued, now we, the National Electrical Code doesn't comply. We're not installing equipment anymore, but NFPA 70E does. So that label that I put on was good for maybe 15 minutes. Now I need to go ahead and install a label that is compliant with uh, 240.5D uh, of, uh, uh, excuse me, 130.5D uh, of uh, 70E. And so that, that's been a thorn in my side, to be honest with you. I want both of these documents to really uh, give us the same uh, indication that we want to give the worker some type of ability to choose his personal protective equipment and keep himself safe. And I have submitted proposal after proposal after proposal to align both documents to say the same thing. Because in reality, both um, standards, NFPA 70 and 70E, want to protect people, and they want to protect buildings, and they want to protect equipment. So I would love to see 110.16 be identical to uh, NFPA 70E. It's not but we are working there. So even though we have to install the fault current and the clearing time and the voltage uh, at the time of installation, that is great. As soon as that uh, equipment has been accepted by the building owner and we're now utilizing that equipment, we have to have another label on there that complies with 70E. All right, thank you, Bob. Then the last question we got in uh, simply states, can you give information on the app for the fault current? Okay, I sure can. So if, um, if, and you know, a lot of times we don't uh, mention vendors or things like that, but if you go on there, and, I, and I'm looking at my phone right now, so the one that, the one that I put on there was just so easy to, to get to, and um, it is Eaton Cooper Busman and available fault current calculator. They allow you to do three-phase calculation and single-phase calculation. So if you can download that onto your phone, Eaton Cooper Busman did a great job uh, allowing us to use the, their app. So great question. All right. Thank you, Bob. That's all the questions that we had. Excellent. Thank you. I hope everybody has a great day today.